So welcome to part four of our series on NMR-based metabolomics. So I'm going to be talking about spectral deconvolution methods in NMR. Um, so this is something we've been leading up to for a little while. We had a last lecture was an introduction to software and some of the databases that are associated with um, NMR-based metabolomics. Um, and this, again, we've seen before, is that distinction between the targeted NMR-based and the chemometric NMR-based metabolomics. So this lecture is going to be on the targeted slash spectral deconvolution. And then the lecture later today is going to be on the statistical spectroscopy or the chemometric approach. And it's partly for you guys to compare and contrast. And I'll perhaps highlight some of the things that I like or dislike about the different methods. So what we're talking about um, with spectral deconvolution and producing lists uh, of annotated compounds is, is called metabolite annotation. And it's to take a GCMS, an LCMS, or an NMR spectrum and produce uh, an annotated spectrum, like what's shown above, or an annotated list, which gives the name of the compounds and their concentration, maybe their absolute or their relative concentration. Now, Historically, when metabolomics began, it was competing against uh, other fields like genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics. In the world of genomics um, or RNA-seq, um, people can go and take sequence reads, uh, type in the letters, compare against GenBank, and they get the genes identified, and then they count the number of transcripts, and they get transcript abundance. So we had a we have a database that's called GenBank that allows you to do RNA-seq or transcriptomic analysis. In the case of proteomics, we can take a, you know, a 2D gel or we can do mud pit proteomics and we can get um, peptide sequence data and we can compare the intensities or abundance and we can run it through MASCOT or other tools and it'll get our protein identifications and will help get the concentrations. So again, an online database allows you to upload data and boom, your answers appear. In the world of metabolomics, up until five or ten years ago, if you took your metabolomic data, punched it in the web, nothing would happen because there really wasn't a resource for getting your metabolite IDs or your concentrations. And what's fundamental or was fundamental to doing that sort of thing, uh, just like BLAST or um, sequence comparisons for, for uh, genomics and transcriptomics, was having a tool that could allow you to convert your spectral data, GC, LC, NMR data, um, and, and to get the constituent components. So spectral deconvolution, I've hinted at it several times, is a way of resolving some complex mixture into its constituent elements. Formally, it's a process of decomposing a set of overlapping or non-overlapping peaks into their additive components. And typically, you'll use some kind of mathematical, often least squares fitting or curve fitting. So in the case of metabolite identification, we've seen this picture before, although it's now color. But what you're fundamentally trying to do is take a mixture, which is shown in blue, and to figure out which peaks correspond to which compounds. Now in NMR, it's not one peak equals one compound. It's combinations of peaks and patterns of peaks that help identify compounds. Here we can see that there are three compounds, A, B, and C, red, green, and purple. And that if you sum those three compounds, their spectra together, you'll get exactly what that mixture is. In deconvolution, we have to go the opposite. We start with the mixture, and we have to figure out which three can, can, can make that. And typically, it's not three that you immediately know. It's, it's 50, or it's 100 that are possible. And from those 50 or 100, you pull a spectrum, compare it, say, does it fit? Yes, no, maybe not. And then you try another one, and try another one. So it's a guess and check method. And if you've done algebra, or when you first learned how to do algebra, solving for x and y and z, it was guess and check. That was the first way that you learned it. But then more advanced methods, you're shown, and it becomes a little more method routine or simplified. But at least for deconvolution, it's a guess and check approach. Now, you can make it pretty automated. And when the spectra are relatively simple and they're relatively broad, 
you can do spectral deconvolution, for instance, in infrared, and it's automatic. And this is examples of, of IR spectra be, being deconvolved into three or four components. This is automatic, and it's quite precise. You can go a little further, and you can get, uh, in this case, about, about uh, 10 or 15 broad Gaussian peaks deconvolving this particular shape here. You can do this for circular dichroism as another example, where you can deconvolve into five or six or seven different components. So this is typically done when you have broader um, constituents. It's the basis to deconvolution of chemical shift or magnetic resonance imaging spectra, um, where you're looking here again, a fairly broad spectrum. It would be the equivalent of about a 100 megahertz um, NMR spectrum. You don't see any coupling patterns here. Um, but they're relatively broad. And within this, you can see the measured spectrum, that's above, and then the actual calculated spectrum, the deconvolved spectrum below, where it looks at about 10 or 15 components. And they include things like uh, GABA and glycine and glutamate and creatinine and phosphocreatinine and spartate and others. Um, it's not the full spectrum for each compound, and as you can tell, there's no coupling patterns. But this is deconvolvable using least squares methods. The problem with high resolution NMR is it's, it's not broad peaks and it's not 15 or 20 broad um, blobs. It, it's, it's hundreds or thousands of very sharp peaks. This is called an ill-conditioned problem in mathematics. Um, so uh, when we have broad peaks, it's easy. When it's sharp peaks and many it's very, very difficult. Amazingly, humans are very good at this. Um, it's also something we've done. It's part of our skill at pattern recognition. It's part of our ability to do speech recognition and image recognition. Our brains are wired to deal with those types of things. So, so in fact, if you give people the resources, they can actually often do a pretty good job to deconvolve that. So if humans can do it, why can't software? And so that's what people have been trying to do. So as I said, when you give people the tools, in this case being the economics example, people can deconvolve complex uh, NMR spectra. They can identify the individual peaks and compounds. They can do the guessing and checking. They can drag and drop and move things up and down. So I'm going to um, go through the economics software, uh, in part because it's one that I know. As I said, there are other tools um, that people can use, but this is one that, um, as I say, I know well. So we'll explain it a little bit. Um, some of you have probably used the economic software. Others might be wanting to, to use it. So there's a set of steps for it. Uh, you can first process the software. So the same thing that everyone does is you transform and phase it. Then there's another step where you try and remove the water. It's called water deletion. And then you'll do some baseline correction. So note that these are manually done, uh, although this software helps facilitate that. Then you'll also do the referencing to make sure everything's at zero ppm with a DSS peak, and that all of the peaks are shape normalized. Usually they're referenced to the shape of DSS, which is often your best looking peak in an NMR spectrum. And then we'll sort of take you the process by which you fit the spectrum. This is this guess and check. So there's this large library of spectra at, measured at many different frequencies and at different pHs that allow you to then click and slide and scale your spectra to try and fit. So it's a, a bit like trying to do, a, you know, solving a, a jigsaw puzzle uh, on a computer where you're dragging and rotating things to see how they fit. Here you're not really rotating, you're just moving things up and down and jiggling peaks a little bit. So if someone's trained on this for a long time, you can fit a very complicated spectrum, as complicated as urine, in about 40 to 50 minutes. You can fit blood, or serum spectrum, about 20 minutes. So it's a manually intensive thing. If you're doing it for the first time, it'll take you four or five hours. So it's something where you have to learn, but uh, it's just like you know, learning a game. And after a while, you can, you can do pretty well. Uh, the Kinetic software is actually accessible in the sense that um, if you have time this, this evening, you could download it. Uh, they have a demo. It's free. Uh, 
And it is obviously commercial, um, but a lot of people will just simply download the software, do their fitting, take a, uh, a smartphone photo of the result, and uh, carry on. Um, so sort of getting around the, the license. I think there are other things, obviously, that the commercial version would, would offer that the, the demo version doesn't fully have. But people are able to do the practice, uh, the fitting, and, and see how uh, it works. So the two components in the NMR suite, they call one the processor, which is sort of like the top spin, um, which allows you to do phasing and water suppression deletion, baseline correction referencing, uh, peak deconvolution or peak reference deconvolution. And then there's the profiler. And the profiler is a deconvolution component. This is the one that uses the library and allows you to f guess and check and fit. So with uh, processing, um, as with any uh, NMR tool, it's top spin or VNMRJ or uh, MNOVA, you, you can take the FID, you can zero fill, you do the FT, you'll do the phase correction, you'll do some baseline correction, you might do some line broadening or some other smoothing process, you'll reference things. And then this reference deconvolution, which is a way of sort of fixing some of the slight phasing problems that happen or accidentally happen. And this uses the, typically the, the DSS peak as, as your reference to help get good peaks. So um, the structure of the software is relatively simple. There's a side panel, <coughs> side view, uh, records your processing history. There's a little dashboard that uh, allows you to click on things. It gives you the full spectrum view. It gives you a, a thumbnail view. And then there's a status bar at the bottom. So if you were to have the program on your laptops, and if we were to do a lab or a prac right now, we would have you all launch the processor program, and you would have uh, everyone upload a file, which is just like anything. File, go to open. Typically, it'll read the spectral parameters uh, uh, from the Brooker or, or Agilent Varian instruments. Uh, then you will confirm the parameters, phase the spectrum, find the DSS reference, remove the water peak, uh, perform the baseline correction, and then perform the reference deconvolution. That might not be exactly in that order, but those are the steps that, that I'll sort of walk you through right now. So typically, if you had uh, the screen and the first view, you could just go to the file, upload, or select your spectrum if it's on your file. It'll read the file parameters uh, and identify whether it's DSS and what sort of concentration, in this case, um, 500 micromolar or 5.5 millimolar. Um, other parameters that are either read from the file and, and you can click and choose. So you'll get your raw spectrum and almost all things you collect by uh, in metabolomics are in water. And so what you'll first of all notice is your, your spectrum kind of looks a little crummy, uh, in part because of the rather intense water peak. Um, so looking a little closer, you can see where things are a little bit out of phase. And so NMR spectra need fixing. Uh, and this is something that uh, anyone who's done NMR quickly realizes. And, and you can see uh, a spectrum before, where you can see poor baseline phasing problems, um, chemical shift referencing problems, baseline problems. What you're trying to do is generate a spectrum that looks like what's shown at the bottom. So the baseline is perfectly flat. Um, the water is now shaped like a Lorentzian, uh, or at least the rhea is shaped like a Lorentzian. The, the water has been eliminated, uh, deleted. Uh, poorly phased peaks are, are now in phase, and everything is properly referenced. So. so this has the tools, so it has line broadening, or that's the smoothing, phase correction, it has baseline correction, shim correction, which is that spectral um, reference deconvolution, region deletion, which gets sort of water, um, and then there's a reverse spectrum, which hardly anyone uses. But these are tools from the processing menu of the processor module. So phasing uh, is interactive. You can slide things left and right um, and improve things um, in both um, fine phase and gross phase, uh, just as you would on, a, on an NMR instrument. It also has some auto-phasing, which allows you to 
speed the process up if you're not well practiced in that area. Then you can also remove the water peak. So there's an example where before all you could see was water. Uh, afterwards, now you see everything but the water. Uh, and this is very important for metabolomics. Occasionally, you'll remove signals that are very, very close to the water. It's just uh, um, a casualty of, of uh, doing this sort of thing. Uh, but uh, it, it certainly helps uh, uh, the fitting overall. Baseline correction is something that most people, let's say, in the protein world don't often worry about, but it is critical when you're trying to do deconvolution and you want something that's absolutely flat. Um, you can use uh, a spline fitting. And again, this is done uh, sometimes semi-automatically, but in most cases it's a matter of, of users sort of saying, I want this fixed up. And so you'll select points and uh, punch along the length of the, uh, essentially the um, baseline of your spectrum and say, this is what I want as baseline. And then it'll produce a, a, a spline fit curve and the result is something that's perfectly flat. So it's very interactive. As I said, there's this reference deconvolution, which is usually to take your best looking peak, and usually that's the DSS peak, and to sort of apply that shape so that it's properly phased, properly balanced to all the other peaks that you see in your spectra. And this just helps straighten up some minor phasing uh, problems or shimming problems uh, that may still be left over from doing your cleanup. So this, so this just, as I say, deconvolves the DSS peaks so that all the other peaks look pretty much the same. So after that, you've done your, your processor and, and you now have a, a spectrum that's really quite clean. Um, there's no water signal. Um, the baseline is perfectly flat. Uh, everything is phased very, very nicely. Um, you can do this uh, same sort of process in, in uh, top spin or, or VNMRJ if you want. Um, the, um, and if the parameters are all saved, it, it should look about the same. Um, and it's, it's something that you should aspire to for any NMR spectra to make it look as clean as possible. But as I'll say, and I'll emphasize, this is a manual process. And it means that even though there's lots of software, if the 30 of you tried to do this, 30 of you would end up with slightly different answers for the spectrum. Everyone will do a slightly different baseline correction. Everyone will phase a little differently. So this is a problem. No. So we, now we'll go to the next step, which is this profiling. This is the deconvolution step. So it's the second part of the software. And, and what you're really trying to do, and this is an example, is you have, just like the first one with the processor, you have the spectral view, you have a thumbnail, you have a sidebar view, there's legends. Uh, there's a navigator which allows you to go bouncing around from one part of the spectrum to the other part of the spectrum. And then below that is a list of the compounds and their concentrations. And what it allows you to do is, at least it's smart in that you can actually hover over different regions and it sort of guesses what spectra or what compounds might be there that are associated with that given peak. So it, instead of the guess and check of I'm guessing from 100, it's sort of I'm guessing from 5 or 10. So it limits your choices, and that makes things a little easier. And you can guess and check on that smaller choice, um, and often the first or second uh, guess or check is, is the one that's, that's correct. So again, if we were running a PRAC or a lab here, uh, we'd have the program, you'd launch the, the profiler, you'd upload your spectrum. Um, in this case, we're working with a 500 megahertz uh, spectrum. Look at the profile compounds. As a rule, as a rule um, you get acquainted with your spectrum by profiling DSS. So DSS actually has four clusters uh, if it's not deuterated. Um, and this is, they're very sharp, very distinct, and this is a way of making sure that everything's working. Um, and you will guess and check, drag and fit, until what's called the subtraction line, which is the difference between your um, fitted spectrum and the observed spectrum is zero, so completely flat. Once you've got your DSS profile, then you go through the rest of the compounds by moving along and letting the computer sort of guide you uh, about which compounds are, are, are the next ones to, to look at. And you tweak their fits, pushing things up or down, moving chemical shift uh, or positions left or right. 
And eventually you finish fitting every single peak. So if you launch the profiler, um, in this case it's already um, identified a bunch of compounds, so maybe you started for a while, took a break, and start again. And you're seeing um, initially the spectrum here. So you'll choose the library. Uh, in this case, you can check a variety of libraries for different frequencies. Um, and um, in many cases, people who use the economic software or other types of tools know which biofluid they're working, and they have a standard list of compounds that they should be expected to find. A standard list of NMR-identifiable compounds, um, in many cases, is published. Um, we've published a lot of them. We've published them for urine, for blood, uh, for cerebral spinal fluid, for saliva. Uh, there are published values for a lot of wines, for juices uh, of different types, for certain types of cell extracts. Um, so some of these are pretty much 100% complete. Others are maybe 90% complete. Um, it would be nice, I guess, if someone, maybe our group, just posted them online so everyone could borrow those lists. But they exist. They exist in, in the literature. And because everyone's looking at something slightly different, um, I guess the list could be infinite. Um, so once you've chosen your spectral library, it's, a, it's appropriate for the frequency. So we're choosing the one for 500 megahertz. Um, now the program's ready. So the first thing, as I say, is you profile DSS. It's a sanity check. It's to say, am I doing OK? Do I understand what I'm doing? Um, so in this case, um, you'll click on DSS, and uh, you can navigate by clicking on this upper left corner uh, at the 0.0, .0 and it'll immediately move you to that region, zoomed in, and you can see how well you're fitting. And you can see that you're not quite fitting perfectly. You need to drag things up and down. So you move things, I guess in this case, up. And then you can click on the upper left bar with those numbers, you know, 0, and I can't read the numbers here, 0 0.6, 1 um, 1.3, and 3 something. And you can see how well things are fitting. So as you drag one peak up, it's also dragging the other three clusters up. If you drag one volts, pH, whatever, light subtle shifts in the chemical shifts from these um, standard positions. So what you're doing is you can see in these cases sort of those noisy green lines. Those are the, the difference lines. And what you want is that difference line to look pretty flat. So you can see the one on the upper right corner looks pretty flat. The one on the upper left corner also, or lower left corner, looks pretty flat. And you can see maybe the one on the lower right is maybe not quite perfect. And so you'll make adjustments, tweaking it. So it's a little bit like art. Um, and it is an art um, to try and get these things all fitted. Um, so you're dragging uh, and changing the positions. Um, so if you are happy with DSS, then you can start clicking and dragging and peak shakes and positions for other compounds. So we can take another compound, which is acetate, which would be in our standard list, and it's found in most biofluids. It's a single peak. Uh, in this case, um, you hope it's acetate, because it could also be sometimes another compound. Um, but um, it's a single peak, and you can identify it, drag it up and down until you end up with a green line that's pretty much near zero. Um, you can also, um, let's say, pull alanine, and instead of dragging and dropping and shifting, you can just say, I'm tired of this, and you can say auto fit. So it'll immediately move those peaks uh, straight to where they should be. And so they're now fit, and you can see the green line is also flat. Now, the more recent versions of, of Konomics support um, much more automated fitting. Uh, in some cases, you can fit an initial spectrum and use those fits to start fitting everything else. So if you've initially fit one and taken 40 minutes or an hour or two hours or two days, and you have a 1,000 more to do, then you can upload what you've fit initially, and it'll try and do its best to take all the other 1,000 spectra and try and match that. And if you've collected consistently, um, um, it can do a pretty decent job. Now, there's still this component of having to um, process and, and um, uh, phase the spectrum, and that still takes a bit of time. But um, again, those parameters can be done, and they can be done inside or outside of the software. 
So as I say, if you're good at this, many people with a bit of training can do a lot of spectral analyses of blood, CSF, fecal water, uh, plant extracts, um, saliva, uh, milk, wine, in about 20 to 30 minutes. Once you've done that, then you can export that data uh, to an Excel file, and it will have the list of the concentrations and the identified compounds. When you've got that list, uh, then you can start doing all the multivariate statistics and the PCA and PLSDA. You're working not with the spectra, you're working with compound lists and concentrations. And this is actually much easier for PLSDA. It's, just, it's the way that gene transcripts and proteomics studies have always been done, which is lists of, con lists of proteins, lists of genes, lists of metabolites, and some concentration value. Now, there are alternatives to, a, to Konomics, so certainly we've talked about Amics. Um, it's, it's like Konomics, it's, an, it's a manual processor. But Brooker also has the food screener, uh, which is a juice screener, wine screener, honey, um, and it's now automated these processes. So for a given uh, spectrometer frequency, typically I guess it's 400, um, the system will, will automatically process uh, and identify uh, about three dozen compounds, uh, or up to three dozen compounds in juices or wines. And it can do a lot of other very cool uh, statistical analyses. There's the quantum mechanical total line shape analysis, um, which uh, I think initially had been developed by some people in universities in Finland, affiliated with Perch. It's sort of not really clear. <laughs> Uh, but that offers an automatic method um, to do uh, spectral deconvolution, and they've done it with uh, serum. Then there's Batman, uh, which we've already talked about, um, which um, does the deconvolution automatically, but it doesn't do the spectral phasing and uh, water deletion and so on. And then we've talked about basal, which pretty much automates everything, uh, probably not unlike the, the juice screener and wine screener. And that's specific for serum and saliva and CSF. So when you compare um, automatic methods to manual methods, and you sort of have people race, uh, typically the automatic methods are about 30 to 50 times faster. Uh, automatic methods have a precision recall that's hovering around 90, 95%. Uh, what's nice is you can do these things in batches. You can do hundreds, literally. The computer doesn't get tired. Uh, as we found, people do, and often they quit. Um, so this has been a real problem for us. It's one of the reasons why we went to automation. Automation uh, is you, is, gives you consistency and reproducibility. Um, now, it could be slightly wrong, but it's reproducibly wrong. So you'll be able to get the same answer. Uh, and you can look at it and say, well, I know I got it wrong. Um, and in many cases, you can fix it um, across the board. Um, it also frequently picks up signals uh, that, that humans m mistake or confuse. So even with our experts, when they compared what, uh, say, Basil was doing, um, we, Basil would identify compounds, and then we'd talk to our experts and say, are you sure? And then they'd say, actually, I'm not. And then you'd go back and trace and spike in. In fact, often the, the tool was, was smarter or better than the expert. So uh, that was sort of gratifying in seeing how automation actually helps. I've mentioned Batman already. It's a project that's open source. You can download it. And if you're familiar with R, or potentially you can even play with it and modify it. There have been several papers written about Batman and several improvements over the years. I'd mentioned some of the issues with it, and it was relatively slow, uh, or very slow. And it sort of chokes on very large, complex mixtures. I've talked about basil as well. Um, so there are applications um, that this website is not the correct one, but um, I think it's basil.ca. Um, so we talked about how it uses this idea of hidden Markov models and the fact that it does the automatic spectral uh, phasing, referencing, and water removal and baseline correction. So that takes the human element out of it, makes it automatic, it makes it sort of a walk-away system. Um, 
So the way that Basil works, as I said, uses um, a hidden Markov model. Um, so if you fit one combination of peaks, you are going to affect the previously fit peaks. And so there's a dependency on what you've done. And it's the same thing with any signal processing for language. Uh, if, we were, if we didn't know the context of what I was speaking or the tech context of the words or sounds coming out, we might confuse those words. So when you're dealing with conditional dependence on outputs uh, and on interpretation, where there's dependencies on what was in and what was out, you're, you're dealing with the Markov model. So a Markov model is formally defined as a conditional probability of the current state n depending on only the previous state. So what I fit affects what I'm viewing. So what I did previously, if I put in the alanine peak and it overlaps serine, it's going to change my, my fitting. So this is an example of how Markov models um, can be used. So if we're talking about weather, and if it's known that after a rainy day, the next day will be sunny with a probability of 30%, and after a sunny day, the next day will bring rain with a chance of 40%, sort of like the weather here, the state diagram for this is, is shown. So you've got run, rainy and sunny, and you've got this um, transition from going rainy to sunny is 30%, sunny to rainy is 40%, and then there's a self-probability, so if it's already raining, it'll continue to rain with 70%, and if it's already sunny, it'll continue to be sunny with 60%. So the probabilities all add up. 0.3 plus 0.7 equals 1. 0.4 plus 0.6 equals 1. So with this model, you can predict uh, the weather for the next day. So if it's rainy, what's the probability that it's going to be, or what are you going to predict? Is it going to be rainy again, or is it going to be sunny? Now, a Markov model is a Markov model, but you can also deal with a hidden Markov model. In this case, the state can't be directly observed. So in a Markov model, we can say we can observe the weather. It's sunny or rainy. So in a hidden <coughs> Markov model, it's assumed that the current state contains all the information about the previous observations. So hidden Markov models are often used in pattern recognition, so for voice recognition, speech recognition, sequence comparison in bioinformatics, DNA protein sequence analysis. It's often used in motif recognition in bioinformatics uh, and other kinds of, of pattern analysis. So the analogy for the hidden Markov model is, okay, we're talking about weather. But this time we've locked you in a windowless room and so you can't see if it's sunny or rainy. But you can only see the people of, or the shoes of the people who had just come in. So you can look through the bottom of the door and you can see their shoes. And so if, it's, if someone told you when it's raining the shoes are dirty, uh, and that's true in 90% of the cases, and when it's sunny, the shoes are dirty only 60% of the time. So that's your indirect observation of the weather. So if you're doing that indirect observation, then this Markov model, which is now a hidden Markov model, has your observations that are round, sunny and rainy, and the probabilities we talked about, but then it re-disposes, uh, I guess, the probabilities of shirty, dirty shoes and clean shoes. So in this case, this 90% um, and 60% probability. So if it's sunny, shoes are dirty 60% of the time. If it's rainy, shoes are dirty 90% of the time. Then you can calculate, well, therefore, there must be a sum of 0.1, so that must mean that shoes are clean, if it's rainy, 10% of the time, and shoes are clean if it's sunny, about 40% of the time. So by looking at shoe uh, cleanliness, you can start predicting the weather. So this is the essence of a hidden Markov model as, as opposed to a, a Markov model. And so in many cases, things are hidden to us. Uh, we're only observing, in this case, the spectra. Uh, we're not able to observe the chemicals. Um, and, and so that regard, we're trying to predict things, and that's why spectral analysis is best done through hidden Markov models. And this is also just sort of reiterated here, where if we think of um, voice um, pickup from a microphone, measuring the frequency of the sound and amplitude of the sound, it kind of looks like 
an NMR spectrum. Not perfect, I mean, we've got up and down, but if we took the absolute values, one would say basically uh, a sound gram looks a lot like an, an NMR spectrum. So you can use the same things, whether it's, I mean, you can think of it as an FID if you want, um, but doing spectral analysis is the standard technique that's used in uh, speech recognition. Uh, so if you're using smartphones to do any speech recognition, uh, this is what they're doing. They're using hidden Markov models. They're doing spectral analysis. They're looking for certain features. They're running it through a hidden Markov model, which is shown on the bottom right there. And then they're looking for patterns that match. They look up a database. And this, this is the database lookup, looking in this case for phonemes for speech. In this case, we're looking at databases of spectral patterns for alanine and glutamine and glucose. And out comes your answer. So if you're running Bazel, um, you can go to the website, bazel.ca, uh, which is the right website. Um, and uh, you can upload a spectrum, or you can click an example. Important thing that everyone forgets to do is to read the instructions. And this gives you a very specific set of instructions of what you should use. So if you're working with a biological sample, especially with serum, you need to filter out the protein. So this is the type of filter you should use. You want to pH it to 7. You want to use a buffer, uh, particularly potassium phosphate. You add, have to add DSS for chemical shift referencing, not TSP. And then if you add either sodium formate or the chloropyrimidine carboxylate, uh, you can use that as a phasing component and as a secondary um, reference for, for quantification. And then if you're going to collect the spectrum, it's a 1D nosy preset at 25 degrees. So these are the general rules, just five quick things of which only it seems like 30% of the people can follow. But this is how you should do it. Um, there's some very detailed descriptions of what you should have if you're having a 350 microliter sample, a 700 microliter sample, how much D2O, how much of your buffer, what your final volumes might be how much of your DSS, your stock, um, potassium phosphate. These are the, these are the referencing compounds uh, or phasing compounds. So DSS for 0.0. .0. Sodium formate is one. We prefer the chloropyrimidine compound, which has a nice single proton signal and, and is very stable and resonates quite a ways away from anything. Formate can be found in biological samples. This chloropyrimidine cannot. Um, and resonates in a unique position. So basically, if you're running basal, you filter, fix, fid, and fit. So filter to get rid of the proteins, fix at the lock phasing and referencing mixtures to the sample, collect the FID with the nosy preset, and then let the program do the fitting. So these are examples of how basal is fitting. And they show once you get up to complicated fluids, where there's 90 or 150 compounds, there's a lot of peaks. And it gets pretty complicated. And having a computer do that certainly makes life a little, little easier. And as I say, we've timed these things. We had an expert fit this one spectrum up top. It took them about 45 minutes. It was using the Konomics. They were using the Konomics software. And then we had Basil run using the same spectrum. And you can see essentially the same fit. Um, this is a few years ago, so the program's a lot faster now. Computers are a lot faster. As I said, if you go to the website, the operation just is clicking on something. It does the standard free induction, uh, zero filling, Fourier transformation, baseline correction, smoothing. All of that's done automatically. And this is just illustrating what's going on. So upload your spectrum, does the Fourier transform, does the phasing, does the reference correction, baseline correction, water removal. And it's typically done in, in 20 to 30 seconds. And then after that, it does the fitting, the deconvolution, the, the hidden Markov model, the weather prediction, if you want. And what you're seeing are the blue spectra, are its calculated deconvolution. And you can see the black is actually the, the actual spectrum. And the blue and the black overlap. That's why it's kind of hard to see a difference. At the same time, it also generates right, so a list, list of compounds um, and their concentrations and a confidence score. 
So if you're fitting acetate, which just has a single peak and can be confused with other compounds, it doesn't have a high confidence score. But if you're fitting glucose, which has about 40 peaks, uh, and every one of those peaks fits, it has a confidence score of 10. So it uses knowledge about both the quality of fit and the number of peaks to, to make an assessment of the confidence. So when we put the web server out there, it was basically for people to try. And we got it working with serum and plasma and CSF, and people got it to work with saliva as well. It doesn't work for urine. It doesn't work for wine. It doesn't work for fecal water. It's limited to instruments at 500, 600, and 700 megahertz. So it doesn't cover the breadth that, say, the Konomics or Amix has. It's a case where if people don't read the instructions, you'll get lousy results. So you have to prepare things in a standard SOP which is something that everyone should do. Uh, but if you do it as described, um, using you know, the constraints that are in it, it, it takes about two to three minutes. You can only do one spectrum, a spectrum at a time. So you've got to wait two or three minutes, upload another spectrum, press, wait, upload another one. So you have to be on the terminal a fair bit if you're running these things. So it is, it is limited that way. We've done some comparisons uh, with Batman versus uh, Basil. Um, and these were published a little while. Batman versus Superman. Um, anyways, we looked at a five compound mixture, 10 compound mixture, 20 compound mixture, and we timed how long things took. And we looked at the level of quantification accuracy uh, based on what was known in there. And you can see there's a fairly big difference in terms of the time and, and accuracy. So, with respect to, to deconvolution, these are sort of sample cases uh, with respect to spectral deconvolution. You can do it either manually or now automatically. There are limitations with the automatic tools. The manual methods allow you to do much more diverse analysis of many different systems with larger databases. But the automatic systems obviously don't get tired and they don't quit. Um, there are significant challenges when the spectra get really, really complicated. It appears that only humans can fit urine, uh, whereas computers seem to choke on that. Um, certainly with improvements in computer um, speed and, and other innovations in algorithms, um, I think automated deconvolution is becoming much more feasible. And, and we're seeing that already with, with how, how Brooker has applied it to a, a number of, of uh, samples. And whether it's through commercial suppliers or, or the freeware world, I think we're all going to see improvements, and I think those are exciting. And it certainly makes NMR metabolomics far more automated. Um, and this is something I think that's really critical if, if, if it's going to be uh, continuing to play a role in, in, in the field of metabolomics research. So we'll close off with the last slide about the